see if that's right. Yeah, I guess that is right. Um, I also want to, or meant to mention in the introduction that I'm a member of the Pros and Cons uh, writing group here in Eugene, um, several of whose members are here um, this evening. Um, the piece uh, that I'm going to read is a, a little segment of the novel from the earlier pages. I think a lot of it um, can stand alone and it's pretty much um, um, you know, self-explanatory what's going on in it. Um, as um, Joan said, the title of the novel is The Deconstructionist or The Things That Didn't Exist. Um, a title for this piece might be Man Badger's Dog. <laughs> The dog's name was not Hegel. If it had been Hegel, the philosopher would have been able to be amused by any number of ironies. The rhapsode of absolute knowledge incarnated as a dog. The theoretician of the master-slave dialectic trotting obediently on the end of a leash. The phenomenologist of the unhappy consciousness lazing on the couch on the lanai. The very image of canine ease snout crossed over four paws, an eye open to a slit to make sure of the world. People sensing these ironies or just a general ironicalness hovering about the name would smile when they heard him call her and might venture some words. Hegel, one might say, that's good. Or Hegel, were you a philosophy major? And there might ensue an exchange about satirical dog names. Back in the past, the other person could have known a Marcus after Marcus Aurelius, or better still, an Ivan or an Attila, which names would be more readily associated with absolute lordship. For his part, the philosopher could cite a Tiberius, the German shepherd who lived next door when he was growing up, and whom her owners called Tibby, which was oddly fitting because she was old and arthritic, and the name got mixed up in his mind with Tibia. <laughs> but once the topic of ironical dog names was broached, someone, the philosopher or his interlocutor, would be bound to adduce Rex, which was really something of the archetypal case. And then somebody could go on to reflect that nobody thinks of the meaning of that name, though originally it must have been ironic indeed. For that was how conversations went, wandering without regard to economy or elegance. But ideally, the logic of the topic would lead to reflections about how Rex, having long since lost its bite, had become a moniker so generic as to be proverbial, which in turn could lead to more general reflections on the attrition of meaning in dog names, with Fido, Rover, and Snoopy instanced as evidence. And then one or the other of them, the philosopher or interlocutor, could, with mock rue, produce the romantic observation that that was true of all names. All words, really, all of them having fallen off from the spontaneous poetry we supposedly uttered in our primitive state. But Donna, who, by human lights, was the dog's owner, said that she didn't want to be making fun of her pet every time she addressed it. Addressed was the word she used, too. It stuck in the philosopher's mind because it was a slightly unusual diction for her, an extra fillip of precision that mocked his own care with words. This raised for the philosopher the really rather intriguing question of whether one could properly be said to be making fun of something, a living thing, that could not understand it was being made fun of. And if one couldn't, and the rhetorical presumption of the question tilted against the possibility, then a further, more puzzling question arose as to what exactly was being made fun of in such cases. The idea of royalty, the human pretension to elevation, to dominion? Because the sport in these names had to come at the expense of something, one would think. But such lines of inquiry, promising as they were, could not be pursued, even in the spirit of mutual disinterested exploration, since to have pursued them would have made it seem like he was advocating too much for his proposal for the dog's name, which was a sure way not to get Donna to do what he wanted. On the other hand, letting the matter drop was not likely to get her to do what he wanted either. <laughs> But he hadn't really wanted her to name the dog Hegel anyway. It had been mostly a facetious suggestion, a bit of throwaway fancy. 
The dog, a sable black and white collie with a black ruff that boxed her face in like chops and put the philosopher in mind of that or orangey elder, that stodgy orangutan, Dr. Zayas from the Planet of the Apes, was too hairy to be a Hegel. Hegel, with its two long vowels mirroring each other on either side of the hard G, seemed to connote a cleaner dog gestalt. <laughs> Going by the sound, a Hegel was a blonde or chocolate lab. The truth was that, though he had maybe been flattered to be brought in on the matter, he hadn't really expected Donna to grace the dog with a name that had meaning mainly for him. Especially since she had gotten the dog to give to her boyfriend, or really almost fiancé, to help patch things up with him after it come out that she had been having a romance with the philosopher. For her to have bestowed the name Hegel on the dog would thus have been to affix to the pet she meant to share with her boyfriend, or really almost fiancé, a name that would have been a reminder of her infidelity for as long as the dog lasted. The philosopher understood she had really only asked him for a suggestion because she couldn't resist the urge to have him participate in her doings which dependency showed once again, in the philosopher's view, how much of a fiction was the idea that things between them, Donna and the philosopher, had settled into mere companionability. Asking him for a suggestion to help name the pet she was giving to her boyfriend, or really almost fiancé, was a way of getting him to act as if he had so perfectly and nobly been converted to friendship that he could do so without cost to his feelings. And while when he took stock of those feelings, he could say with conviction that he was quit of all romantic interest in her, still, it galled him to think she would ask him to help tie the bow on the present she was offering to the guy he had not even regarded as a rival, but as a clumsy, unwitting obstacle to his unalloyed enjoyment of her affections back when he wanted them. That wasn't friendship, that was vassalage. So maybe his proposing she named the dog Hegel was also a little hostile. A way of telling her he wasn't going to be the good sport she wanted him to be. The name of Donna's boyfriend, or really almost fiancé, was Scott. Scott, much to Donna's surprise and chagrin, had, after a long and valiant struggle with his feelings, a struggle in which his love and desire for her had to contend with the pain and outrage, outrage inflicted on that love and desire by the disclosure that she had been regularly cheating on him for over a year, found himself unable to accept her peace offering. Donna had related this to the philosopher over the phone, distraught and tearful, but also not without the philosopher detected a certain admiration for her own ability to cause harm. He thought she was like a superheroine in an origin tale, staring in awe at the rubble to which her newfound powers had reduced a building. The upshot was, at the very time she had at last graduated, moved into her Nana's apartment, and started a new job across the bay, putting her sociology major to use as a bill collector for an art factory that made innocuous paintings for hospitals and other institutions with titles like Amethyst Mist and Cerulean Dreams, the dog had boomeranged into her lap. So, when a week or so later she called back, the philosopher should have known what was coming. Maybe he did but he had been quite smitten with his latest adjective for describing his existential state. The contradiction between its denotation and its connotation was deliciously strenuous. He couldn't refrain from popping it on her after she had begun, to, begun by asking him how he was doing. Non-existent, he blithely replied, but immediately he knew it was a mistake. For not only did it sound like a plea for sympathy, as in, I am so low since we broke things off that I feel like I don't exist, but also, he realized, the problem with not existing was that it deprived one of grounds for saying no. It was too easy for Donna to turn his word around on him, asking, well, since you don't exist, I don't suppose it will be any skin off your nose. The mixed registers further irked the philosopher to come over now and then and play with Lexi. Lexi? At first, the philosopher hated it. It sounded like just the sort of name a sorority girl would come up with, a 
pathetically special, classy sounding name with connotations of luxury and sexiness. A name that projected the naive self-regard of the namer. The first time he had gone over to Donna's place to meet the dog, the existence of the dog as a living thing was pretty much covered over by the wrong-headed, maladroit name. Here's Lexi, Donna had announced as a jaunty beast came up to him and he petted it and said, Hi Lexi, with all due tender encouragement, although all she really was to him at that point was an aesthetic blot, a bit of gaucherie Donna had inflicted on the universe. He could, he could never warm up to a dog with such a tacky name, he thought. Though it pleased the philosopher that Donna's bright scheme had backfired and she was saddled with a large quadruped requiring daily care and attention at the beginning of her new, free, post-collegiate life, he was not so stingy as not to help her out by going over a couple of afternoons a week or so and walking the dog, though not so often as to let Donna off the hook of her mistake completely. He would help out some, mostly because it made him feel bad to think of the dog left to dangle in the void all day. At least he thought that was the main reason. Without a human's ruses for dividing and subdividing ennui into digestible units, the day would be one big muddle for the dog to paddle in until the jubilee moment when Donna's Honda finally hummed to a halt outside and things started happening again. Not yet too, full-sized, but small for a collie, immensely furry, far furrier than the philosopher, but without the long tassels hanging down her flanks that Donna hoped she'd yet develop for the full lassie effect, but with a big maple leaf of white fur atop her sable back that flopped as she went, as if it were loosely held on with a piece of tape like a kick-me sign, and a couple of twigs stuck in her tail, she was, despite the mysterious captivity she had to endure, always sweet-tempered and uncomplaining. Was she not baffled by her lot, the philosopher wondered, her inexplicable doggy Gevorfenheit? Donna argued that it wasn't so bad because the dog slept most of the time she was alone, but to the philosopher that made the dog's lot even worse. Forced to spend her one chance at life comatose, absent from her own cameo on earth, as he consorted with the dog, the divide between her name and her being closed soon enough. Soon enough, the reality of the dog, for him, had expanded and engulfed the name. So that whereas initially the name had obstructed his view of the dog, after a while the reality of the dog triumphed over the infelicitous name. Which is to say that it became felicitous. No longer did the dog with whom he took long walks around town that summer have the name Lexi stuck to it, but it was his boon companion, Lexi, who happened to be a dog. Since the philosopher was nothing if not protean, moreover, the dog's name began to metamorphose, sure sign he had accepted it. In just over three months it had turned into lex, lexicon, lexical or lexical beast, dyslexy, exile, exly, exlex, exlax, exolotal, exlassy, lasexy, and there was no reason to think it wouldn't keep fructifying indefinitely. Donna herself got in on this onomastic play one day in the middle of a parking lot on Grizzly Peak when they each had a car there waiting with an open door and the dog like Buridan's ass, perfectly equidistant between two bales of hay and unable to choose, ran around and around in a circle, barking in charming confusion, while Donna slapped her thigh and called, Come on, come on, girl, come on, perplexy. <laughs> Perhaps the dog's name proved so feckin' because it didn't, couldn't perfectly stick the way a person's name could stick. She was Lexi, Lexi was she, even in the philosopher's mind, and yet, since it was at the least problematic to imagine her thinking of herself as Lexi, as having that kind of word-mediated, ma actively functioning self-concept in which one's name is fused with one's being, one couldn't very well think that the name Lexi had penetrated to her inmost canine core. This was perhaps the general problem of which the question of whether she could be made fun of if she couldn't know she was being made fun of was only a specific case. A pet name was a one-way street. The humans used it, but the pet didn't, unless you counted responding to it as a kind of use. 
There was thus always something satirical about a pet name, even the most sincere and univocal. A pet name was a bid to extend the domain of human meaning beyond its borders, a gesture at once mocking, mocking that is of the human imperialism as much as of the uncomprehending pets, and poignant. But even in that case, it wasn't clear whether the pet understood the name as its name or whether it was just the agreeable sound that it, in its dumb, silent brain center, understood to mean something like, now they're looking at me in the good way. Now something, food or walk or play, is going to happen. Of course, the possibility existed that the tone was the chief cue that tickled the dog's ear. As a kind of experiment, the philosopher, instead of asking, do you want to take a walk? would say, do you want to bake a squash? Or do you want to take a do you want to fake a talk? And Lexi would perk up and present herself at the door, all eager for the experience that seemed to be foretold by these phonetic agglutinations. To push the experiment still further, the philosopher tested the hypothesis that saying anything with the excited pitch with which he normally announced a walk would prompt in the dog the expe expectation of said activity, as manifested by the behaviors, stamping, twisting, tossing her snout, in what could only be interpreted as pointing, in front of the door that led down to the street. When, for example, he asked her over and over again, shall we hang ourselves now? Shall we hang ourselves? Sure enough, the happy animal did her dance by the door, ready for release. It wasn't just that she didn't know what his sounds meant, it was that she couldn't know that there was such a thing as meaning to begin with. So interrogating her, the philosopher was performing an odd mortification of language itself, as if that much celebrated human faculty had done him wrong somewhere along the line. Strange animus, this degradation of words to noise behavior in the dog's ears, a rare and involuted keenness for destruction, as it had once occurred to the philosopher and he had told Donna, who replied, is that what it is, is it? But to Lexi, all the patter must have been like the quacking of ducks was to him, excited noises signifying excitement. Except that, as far as humans went, he was probably distinguished in the dog's mind as the one who commanded a bigger, more operatic range of sounds, and this probably jived with what he liked to imagine was her sense that he was more of a mensch, more of a member of the pack, more of an honorary dog. It was for these reasons that one, a stray narrator, say, who happened to be in the woodwork of a sunny kitchen in the Berkeley Flats on a summer afternoon in 1989, would have witnessed a man enthusiastically asking a dog over and over again, can you believe you exist? Can you believe you exist? And the dog looking at him quizzically while cocking her head now to this side, now to that, as if she thought she could only, she could understand him if only she could get her ear in the right position. <laughs> the movement was so winsome that the philosopher wondered whether she, he was badgering her to get her to move her head like that, and then whether she moved her head like that to get him to badger her, because to the dog the badgering was precious attention. Can you believe you exist? The question, which had probably originally arisen as a way of expressing the philosopher's compassion for the dog left to face the unstructured void while Donna was gone from her apartment all day, as if the experience of so much emptiness was bound to erode her sense of her own reality, had since taken on a life of its own. The philosopher kept finding more and more meaning in it. It seemed to him that with each fresh iteration, he felt the jab of each word with greater distinctness. Can, he'd start, and even as he pronounced the word, he felt the yearning of the interrogative, the real desire to have an answer. You, ambiguously addressing the dog, and also one, anyone, any being who could do that, believe, as if that mental act needed to be performed with the right ardent sincerity to lift it above mere skinny supposing and thinking, which was what the philosopher was trying to do by meaning his question keenly enough in mind or gut, so that then the object of that belief, you, the same you, canine or human, that was trying to reach itself with the belief, was made to seem uncanny 
as did this weird thing, exist. For it was the full Latinity of this last word that the philosopher tried, each time the question came to rest, to position his mind to register, as if the dog standing there was just now standing forth out of some utter void, arriving by means of an ontological hoop trick, captioned with a voila or a tada. All the while, the dog increasingly whipped up, tossed excited looks over her shoulder, where somewhere lay the child's boot they tussled with when they tussled. But no word sounded like boot here. Major meanings were in play. Can you believe you exist? The philosopher asked again, insisting he, f he felt more deliver deliberately than ever on each word. When, in the alembic of his soul, he crossed the various ways he could stress the words with the gamut of humors with which he could produce the question, keen, probing, scoffing, innocent, hortatory, giddy, vehement, every offering of the question on an ideal, empirical level was different. Each one had a different spin, a different English. With each release, his soul leaned like a bowler trying to steer the ball with his abdomen as it skirted the gutter. So again, con brio, can you believe you exist? The question now an exclamation of wonder and joy, as in, isn't it great that we exist? Isn't it fantastic? It was an outcry in which the excited words expressed the inability of consciousness to compass an amount of wonder commensurate with the big brute luck of their being there. For there they were, a pair of big leisured mammals, a Canis lupus familiaris and a Homo sapiens sapiens, two lumps of protoplasm, as his father used to say, trying in an awkward, affectionate way to disclaim the wanted human view, although it had never quite worked for the boy, whose aesthetic sense had balked even then at deriving fur from plasm. But in any case, two big respiring bodies blossomed up out of nothing, lit by beams from a distant burning star set, sent straight across all that space to find them there in that kitchen facing off. The philosopher paused, scrutinizing the dog, scrutinizing him. The dread moment of leave taking was imminent. Behind a splash of glare, the wall clock poked on, a Sisyphus on stilts, making its way up and down the same snowy Olympus, each loose snap of the minute hand wobbly establishing its next toehold. The cupboards, the stove, all the surfaces of the white enamel room were positively aglow in the sun. Can you believe you exist, the philosopher asked, now with a kind of hopeful innocence, and then, can you believe you exist? With an almost angry desperation, trying to squeeze his mind to believe he could find the key to unlock speech in her, translate her across the species.